I think what happens is there is a genuine, obviously a genuine concern. I just want to point to like the first, really the first sentence of your uh, foreign policy article. Um, the title of that is Western nonprofits are trampling over Africans' rights and land. Mm-hmm. And uh, the first sentence, I mean, it really sets the stage of like the the state of the world right now, which is the yeah. ex- the accelerating <laughs> deterioration of the natural environment has manifested in devastating loss of, in, of biodiversity and extreme weather events posing existential threats to our world. So we're all living through truly this you know, catastrophic climate change and uh, environmental degradation on a scale that I don't know if human beings have ever lived through that we've ever mm-hmm. gone through. So understandably, this crisis certainly is about climate, but it's about, you know, the fact that, you know, well over half of all wildlife has been decimated in the past, like, half a century. I mean, it's it's really staggering the, the, the losses that we're experiencing. Mm-hmm. So again, people are understandably concerned about conserving these places, uh, what they perceive as, as, you know, wildlife, right? Mm-hmm. But again, that sympathy or that empathy or whatever it is, I, I think is often really easily hijacked by yeah. the very institutions that are creating the problem in the first place. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, so, absolutely. Yeah. 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 I mean, for sure. I think that there are absolutely valid concern, you know, reasons for concern, right? I'm deeply troubled by this unprecedented loss of biodiversity, right? Which by the way, disproportionately impacts black and indigenous communities, right? Absolutely. We've already done, there there are so much, we already have mounting evidence now that the elite class, you know, particularly those of the global North are able to shield themselves from these, from the consequences of ecological crisis when, Mm -hmm. Others are actually suffering the brunt of it. Um, Absolutely. So, yeah, I'm I'm deeply concerned, right? Like, I got into this work because of my concern, but also because of the people I love, right? The people Mm -hmm. I'm in community with, and those are Africans. And what I mean by Africans, I don't just mean an indigenous people too, right? Like, Mm -hmm. not just Africans of the continent, but of the diaspora, right? Because there are actually global patterns in, in the ways in which, you know, the disposability of Black and indigenous people are orchestrated on a day to day basis, right? But Um, so yeah, there are valid concern, but one thing that we should always be cognizant of, right, that we tend to often lose sight of is that, um, biodiversity conservation is like nested within the same global distribution of costs and benefits as most extractive industries, right? So Mm -hmm. what do I mean by that? I mean that those who are paying the e incommensurable costs of protecting forests, waters, and wildlife for the entire world are disproportionately located in the local in the global south, right? Mm-hmm. That's in particularly in Africa, particularly in Latin America and the Caribbean, right? Mm-hmm. In Latin America, Afro-Latin communities are also disproportionately targeted for biodiversity conservation. So Africans, indigenous communities are paying the cost of protecting forests, waters, and wildlife, right? But Mm -hmm. like climate change, you know, the fundamental drivers of biodiversity loss are the political and economic structures that overwhelmingly, you know, benefit the capitalist core in the the, uh, global north, right? Mm -hmm. So yes, we should be concerned. Absolutely. There are reasons to be concerned, but we should also be cognizant of who is actually paying the cost of protecting biodiversity um, versus who's truly benefiting from these structures that have been put in place, right? Mm -hmm. That are actually the major drivers of biodiversity loss. Mm-hmm. Yeah, let's talk about the um, the ways in which this is happening. So um, I, I want to talk about the 30 by 30 plan. Um, and uh, it's also known as the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. Um, mm-hmm. 
uh, if you could talk about who is proposing this plan, what it is exactly, and how it's going to be enacted or is currently being enacted in 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 the global south. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So the thirty by thirty um, plan, you know, which is called also known as the post 2020 global biodiversity framework. It's a global plan to double the coverage of protected areas by setting aside 30% of land around the world for biodiversity conservation by 2030, Mm. right? So it was initially proposed by conservation NGOs and now it's supported by the United Nations Environmental Program, Um, IUCN, which is the International Union for Conservation of Nature, but it's also backed by corporate donors, right? Like Mm -hmm. now we actually have a corporate capture of this plan. Mm -hmm. And this is when things start to get very, very murky. Um, But then, you know, to really understand the scale and pace of devastation that this plan will have, you know, will, uh, if this plan that will happen if this plan were to materialize. Um, you have to look at the historical place uh, pace of establishing protected areas, right? Mm-hmm. So right now, protected areas cover fifteen percent of like the territory, you know, territorial cover, mm-hmm. and this coverage took place over one hundred and fifty years timeline, right? Since the first, mm-hmm. the, since Yellowstone was established up today, there have been. of land cover that has been put aside for biodiversity conservation. Mm -hmm. Now, the 30 by 30 plan essentially proposes to do that, to put in add on another 15% in less than eight years, right? Mm -hmm. So it is proposing to do what it took to do in eight years, less than eight years, what it took to uh, 150 years to do. And wow. all within the context of climate change, right? Mm-hmm. And unprecedented ecological uh, crisis, and on top of like a complete reshift of geo, of global geopolitics as well. So you have mm-hmm. to keep that pace in mind, right? And right. also the context within which this is also happening. I mean, and there are like a constellation of like forces that are working in tandem to implement the plan on the ground and. I mean, they're using all a range of like coercive mechanism from environmental policies to private public partnership, land reforms and predatorial, you know, neocolonial, neocolonialist development programs from IMF and the World Bank. Right. So there's like it's just hard to conceptualize in you know one or two sentences right sure. how these plans are being implemented right now it's like there are all kinds of mechanisms that are being used right to materialize the plan at this point okay so so yeah i, I do think it, it it's important to know then how this is being because I, I think this is the the important point here is that the way it's manifesting on the ground for people that live in these areas that are being you know, land is basically being grabbed, right? Yeah. Um, it, it, there, there's aspects to this, which is that it has nothing to do with actually protecting these lands because the lands are being grabbed, they're being taken, but then they're being kind of used for extractive industries or they're being used for tourism, they're being used for um, capitalists of the global north, basically, to either yeah. extract wealth from, either through, again, through extractive uh, industries or through... You know, you hear about, you know, wealthy people going on safaris or on hunt, you know, hunting expeditions yeah, and so on. Yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely. And and so, yes, <laughs> you know, you've <laughs> said it right. It's a land grab, right? Mm-hmm. Like, it's a land grab that's being masked by, you know, under the guise of biodiversity conservation. It's a land grab that is being, you know, making use of every possible law and legal mechanism that has been co-opted, right? And there are really, um, you know, when we talk about, when I say that it's it, that transnational conservation now, when you place it within the global economic or capitalistic structures, you know, how what does that look like on the ground, right? How mm-hmm. is it, how is transnational transnational conservation and extractive project right a glo- at, at a global scale 
mm-hmm. two things, right? And and one that we tend to focus most on is that a lot of these lands are being propped up for wildlife tourism, which is, by the way, for, for countries like Tanzania and Kenya, South Africa is an extremely lucrative business and not mm-hmm. just even there, right? Like our focus is mostly on Eastern and Southern Africa for mm-hmm. the most part, but Central Africa and even in West Africa also does have uh, gained a lot from tourism as well, wildlife tourism, but we just often not not think of them as much, right? Because we're mm-hmm. very focused on Eastern and Southern Africa, right? But it's mm-hmm. pervasive. It's across the continent. Mm-hmm. I mean, Chad in itself also has sort of emerged over the past 10 years as a destination for wildlife tourism in Chad, right? Since mm-hmm. African parks is now there and so has Benin as well. So so one way it actually extract wealth um, is through wildlife tourism, right? And trophy hunting, right? It's a very lucrative business, but you have to see who owns, who are these tour operators. Mm-hmm. A lot of them are, you know, uh, are not from those countries. They're from the global north, what I call the imperialist core. Mm-hmm. Sure, you know, we can talk about um uh, American, we can talk about European businesses, you know, tourist operators, but we don't often talk about Middle Eastern one, right? Like right. Lebanon, for example, owns a big share of, of, of hunting, not Lebanon, but I, I should say Lebanese settlers in Senegal, mm-hmm. my, my home country, mm-hmm. right, own a big proportion of hunting concession rights in Senegal, right? Mm. Middle Eastern, also in Southern and, 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 and Eastern African countries too, own a big share of the wildlife tourism businesses, right? So it's right. not just, you know, this old way of seeing the West versus African. It, it, it's a lot more nuanced than that. You know, there are a, a broad array of different actors and I shouldn't right. even forget the local elites themselves, right? Mm -hmm. African Mm -hmm. elites, the aspiring bourgeoisie within Africa who are also taking part in this um, tourism business. Um, So that's one, but, and then the other one, the other way of extracting, of extracting uh, wealth from protected areas or biodiversity um, conservation areas is also through concession for extractive industries, Mm -hmm. right? Logging, Mining, mm-hmm. logging and mining are actually happen often on cons- on on, on uh, conservation land a lot, right? In mm-hmm. Botswana, in DRC Congo, right? Um, and Survival International, which is an NGO that's for you know that's really at the forefront of the battle for decolonizing mm-hmm. um, conservation, but also protecting indigenous right within conservation, right? Have published tons of report on how mining industries are actually an active actor, right? Like entity mm-hmm. within the transnational conservation project, extractive project. So. Concession rights for extractive industries are given, you know, concession permits for extractive industries are given left and right to extractive industries um, for mining exploration, for mining exploitation, but also even logging as well. Mm -hmm. Um, Mongabe, you know, there, there are tons of reports out there. And if you think that biodiversity conservation and and mining you know are not don't coexist it coexists very well right like think mm-hmm. about for example the washington post um report a couple of months ago that actually showed that um that the biden administration has issued more permits mm. right more permits for mining exploration I mean, not mining, but I think it's, I can't it's, remember. I think what, it's uh, for oil. Is oil. it oil? Yeah, I oil and so, gas yeah. exploration mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. on public lands, conservation lands, and mm-hmm. any other administration mm-hmm. in the U.S. And the same thing happens in the global south as well. Right, right. So, yeah. Yeah, well, I, I just wanted to, yeah, again, at this article, you're talking about African parks. Yeah. Um, it's a, it's a nonprofit conservation agency. Um it seems like it has a lot of, of influence and in, in control in, in many different uh, regions around uh, Africa um, mm-hmm. regarding, you know, these um, national parks. Um, 
I mean, it's founded by a, what, a Dutch billionaire. Um, <laughs> and I just want to point to this thing. And where... it's also the current president <laughs> of African Parks is Prince Harry, by the way. Oh, okay. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> we talk a lot about, you know, a lot of people are familiar with the idea of like, okay, corporations and, and the state, right? Governments are very intertwined. Like their interests are very much aligned. That's yeah. obvious. Yeah. But we don't often, I, I don't think a lot of, I think it's becoming more uh, becoming more aware of this, but like these major nonprofit organizations, these NGOs have also that same kind of relationship with corporations and states as well, where there's, you know, people who serve in, in major financial financial institutions, banks, oil companies, weapons, mm-hmm. I mean, all these different, you know, major uh, corporations are serving on the boards of these nonprofits. Mm-hmm. So th- those interests are obviously going to align and we can, again, see these um, conservation efforts, if you want to call them that, as really just a way to grab land and to make that yeah. available yeah. for extraction and for, you know, tourism and, and so on. Yeah. 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 Some- no, I mean, <laughs> absolutely. It's, you know, and it's no secret either. It's not like you can't, they're hiding. They're like there, <laughs> right? Yeah. Like they're hiding, but like in plain sight. All you have to do is just Google you know, who's sitting on the board of these major conservation (laughs) NGOs and things start to connect, right? Like, if you look at, at, you know, I'll just give the the example of like the five largest conservation NGOs, the Nature Conservancy, right, um, is, I can't remember his name, but is currently headed, he was the former CEO of Goldman Sachs and Merrill Lynch. Mm. Goldman Sachs is has by um with the Oakland Institute has published a report I think in 2009 showing that a lot of the land grabbing that is happening in Africa right for agricultural production right that Goldman Sachs is responsible for sizable you know amount of land grabbing or what they call land acquisitions in Africa Mm -hmm. um Mm -hmm. in 2009 right um Mm -hmm. So that's who's sitting at the, who's the head of Nature Conservancy. Conservation International is Wes Bush. We all, you know, Mm -hmm. Wes Bush used to be the CEO of uh, Thorman, Norman Thurb, I forgot Uh, the name of it, but it's basically one of the largest military, artillery and military weapon manufacturer. And by the way, Mm. I mean, militarized conservation is on the rise right now. Right. Um, then you yeah. have, I mean, it's it, conservation society is headed by a billionaire for Argentina. It, it's just, I mean, right. <laughs> like I said, it's no secret. You just have to go to their yeah. website and see who's sitting on the board. They're right. all connected to extractive industries and Western uh, financiers and yeah, and sure. venture capitalists. It's just, it's the idea that they have created that capitalism is the only thing that can save nature. Right. Mm-hmm. Capitalism mm-hmm. is actually the major and <laughs> not, mm-hmm. not major, the sole reason why we're in this crisis that we're in right mm-hmm. now. But, yeah, you're trying to convince us that they are the one who are going to basically save the world. It's, it's totally ridiculous. Mm-hmm. 